right, welcome to the show, Libertarian Counterpoint. Tonight, I'm going to be your host, Tyler Kuski. On the show, we, we also have uh, James Ust, who is the uh, vice chairman of the Sacramento Libertarian Party. And we also have uh, James, or Jason McPhee, who is an engineer for the state of California. And uh, first on our subject, uh, I'd like to ask you guys a question. How has Donald Trump served us as president? What do you guys think? I mean, what, you work for the state. What, state what, what, how does it affect California, if, if at all? Uh, well, certainly uh, Donald Trump's policies are a little bit different than uh, a lot of the uh, policies that California might follow. Um, and certainly we can see that some of the most vociferous uh, of his um, uh, people who are, are challenging him out there mm -hmm. on the national scene are from California. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I think, you know, Donald Trump is sort of a mixed bag. I mean, he's, he's somebody who is, uh, you know, he has uh, gone out there and done some cutting in government, which, you know, is, is probably a good thing to return some of these things to the private sector. But on the other hand, he also um, seems to be growing government in other areas. Uh, okay. Certainly the spending is, is pretty high under him as well. Do you think it's clear enough to say that, that uh, it, it is better or worse than previous presidents, or do you still say it's, it's pretty mixed? I think it's 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 worse in some areas and, and perhaps better than others. I think one thing that's good about him is he's challenging some of the status quo thinking. Mm -hmm. So whenever you get people, you know, that start to uh, break out of their traditional molds in dialogue, I think that's always a good thing. But um, you know, he certainly is needlessly abrasive on many issues, and um, uh, you know, I, I think there's probably uh, quite a few areas where he's. Uh, missing the boat. I know certainly one is having a, uh, an overly active hand in trade is probably a bad thing in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, the short answer is no. But of course, life is more complicated than just a simple yes or no answer. There's uh -huh. lots of things that I don't mind he's knocked the presidency off a pedestal. And so I would have preferred a, a more, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? A pleasant way. That's why I voted for Gary Johnson. He would have not done the same thing, but not in such a destructive way. Maybe a nicer version of Trump would have been nice. <laughs> well, yeah, well, something like that. It's. I it, mean, do you, do you think that that maybe uh, like out of the? I mean, let's let's maybe ask more of an open question. Who is the most libertarian president we've ever had? I mean, do you guys? I mean, do you guys have a thoughts? Well, that thoughts would be George Washington. But George Washington. Washington. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a downhill slide ever since. Yeah, I think you stole the word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think any, anybody who was so willing to give up power as mm -hmm. George Washington was, I, I mean, certainly we could have gone many other directions in that first presidency and the idea. I, you know, it amazes me when you hear people talk about the greatest presidents and how few people say George Washington. And I mean, you know, my gosh, he's the person who set the trajectory for the country, you know, as far what, as... What about his thoughts on the Whiskey Rebellion? I, yeah, I, I, clearly he's had some bad moments, too. <laughs> so maybe not the most perfect president, but definitely the closest towards libertarianism. Yeah, well, and you have to, you know, there's uh, government of the times. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's times periods where you need more government, and there's time periods when you need less. We've clearly entered a time where we need much less than we have now. And okay. so, you know, but there was always some form of some form of government. You go back four or 5,000 years. Even when it's just a minimal impact, there's mm -hmm. still that exists, and we can't ignore that either. Well, how about, let's just talk, uh, bring this to more of an economic level to make it simple. Um, do you think that Trump is doing a good job on uh, either defending or creating capitalism in the U.S., or, or do you think it, it allows or opens up the gate for socialism to take root? I don't think he has much of a matter of, of a play in the grand scheme of things i don't think he makes a difference you don't think he he, he would him, be him himself makes a difference no i don't think he makes a difference i i think unfortunately his even though he he may do some things that wind up being good i think his rhetoric is so terrible that even if some of his actions turn out to be good for uh, the country in the long run the rationales for why he's doing them will cause us to potentially learn the wrong lesson in the long run and and mm -hmm. have an overly active hand in government. What well, do you think yeah. it, it, that I mean? Maybe Trump is kind of uh, because people hate him so much and they have the kind of this cognitive bias to always attack him. Do you think it maybe it creates more socialists? Maybe I mean uh, because everyone likes, especially people on the left, are typically refer to him as a capitalist. Whether or not we as libertarians think he's capitalist is, is, is irrelevant uh, in the long run because. 
what I think uh, has happened is that we have a significant rise in, on uh, more and more socialists coming in, especially re- uh, Democrats who are who are running for the twenty twenty presidential election. I mean, we have uh, a couple people that are that are in there that we got you know some front runners. Obviously, you got uh, Bernie Sanders again, and you, ha- you also have uh, Joe Biden, who may, may not be a socialist, but you definitely have a lot a lot of crazies. What, what are you guys' thoughts on, on the uh, Democrats that are that are supposedly going to uh, overtake the presidency? <laughs> well, I think with the exception of Bernie Sanders, the socialist wing is actually struggling getting any any grip so? any grip outside of their little enclaves, like mm-hmm. you know L.A., New York, the Bay Area, those kind of enclaves. They're they're very strong there, but outside of those areas, they're not. If you look at the at the data, the wild data, it's they don't play very well outside of those areas. Now, Bernie Sanders has a proven track record of being able to hang around, and that ability to hang around might play well for him in the long run. But Camilla Harris, and every time someone becomes a front runner, two weeks later they're dust. So we'll see how it plays out. Okay. Well, out of out of the uh, de- Democrats, um, do you think that uh, who, who do you think is actually going to be on the uh, final ticket? What do you think they're going to? Who do you think they're going to pick? I have no idea. Do you really say? I certainly imagine it'll it'll either be Bernie or uh, Kamala Harris, but I think a lot of this is because of, of this backlash. Like uh, I think you were kind of alluding to with Trump, uh, the idea that uh, uh, so many people are, I guess, it's it's pushing a lot more people possibly to both identity politics and towards uh, you know issues of, of you know a government welfare state maybe, and and so that's. Uh, one of the things I think is so dangerous about Trump is that, you know, regardless of what you think about him as far as how he's doing as a president, the fact that mm-hmm. the that the hangover may be so bad, you know, <laughs> when <laughs> if people rebound in the other direction and decide to vote as, as some kind of a protest, you know, against yeah. Trump and just to take the most uh, farthest person from him that they can find, I think that could be uh, pretty dangerous for us as far as a slide toward uh, more bigger government programs and socialism. But we could also end up with someone ethical. You know, there is that that other option. You, you know, you don't necessarily have to swing to someone extreme. You could, yeah. there are, there, uh, Andrew, what is Yang, is that his name? I yeah, yeah, Andrew, yeah, Andrew, yeah. I don't particularly agree with his politics, but he seems like a fairly ethical ethical person. And so okay. if it swings the opposite way in terms of ethics, then that's fine. You know, you can you can work with someone like that. Okay, so you th- you think that yeah yeah no I I, I do like like his uh, candidacy and he does try it uh, I have seen a lot of his his attempts to try to appeal to or towards conservatives and libertarians he is making somewhat of an attempt although not not so much of a good good job with the whole universal income behind him I don't think he'll ever really be able to break through uh, but he is tr- trying to make an appeal towards everybody uh, whereas you get other people like Camila Harris who is. Uh, Really, just kind of brag about being a woman and her skin color. And yeah, and stuff. she's and ignoring all the devastation she's causing families here in California. Complete identity <laughs> politics. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's in my neighborhood is destroyed by you know the drug war policies that you know she helped, she helped uh, create and enforce, and plus the the um, policies of you know sending uh, children to no the parents of children to jail for not. For their kids being truants. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a. If, if she'd have been around when I was in high school, my parents would have been in trouble. I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so there's just uh, there's an authoritarian streak in her that is not. It's almost as bad as Trump. If she's just more pleasant, essentially, is. Is like a pleasant Trump? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, there's pleasant. a pleasant Trump we're looking for, right? <laughs> <laughs> Only pleasant if you're not sitting across from her in a hearing. <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> But what, one of the things I actually find is a breath of fresh air about Yang is, uh, you know, how how much more uh, congeniality he's bringing to the discussion. You know, I mean, he's actually sitting across the table from other conservative types and having reasoned discussions. I don't agree with his stance on universal income, but or universal basic income. But mm-hmm. uh, the, the bottom line, though, is is that at least it's a uh, a move toward more civility, which I think is massively refreshing in this day of an age. Because as you can see right now with the bar hearings and everything else, I mean, we've just moved into this era of massive, you know, conflict between the two parties, <laughs> worse than I've ever seen it. I think. Yeah, well, so. it's, it's, I don't. <clears throat> I don't think it's worse than it's ever been as kind of an amateur historian, mm-hmm. but it, it is pretty bad and it's getting pretty darn close. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. 
I still think that the, I think the, the front runners will either be Bernie Sanders or, or um, our former vice president. Um, so I mean, I mean, of of those two, who do you think is going to be more, more ethical? Do you think uh, would, would it be someone who's trying to promote socialism or someone who likes to sniff women or something like that? <laughs> well, Bernie's more ethical than than Joe Biden is, but you know, it's neither one's a high bar to cross if you actually kind of go look through their their history of hypocrisy, you know, they're mm -hmm. both kind of littered with hypocrisy, which, you know, name a politician who isn't really, <laughs> it, it becomes difficult, but it, I couldn't choose between the two, but that's why I vote for guys like Gary Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the benefits that Biden has is that he's, he's somewhat predictable. I mean, I think if, if people elect him, it's sort of like a vote for Hillary. You know what you're getting ahead of time, but it's kind of just more of a slide in that direction gradually instead of hopping off the cliff with Bernie. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, I kind of I agree with that point. I mean, it, it, at least with, with, with uh, Joe Biden, it, it is a lot. It's business as usual, I guess you could say. Uh, whereas uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, it's going to be so radical that it, it would just, the system would implode on itself. Yeah, but it's so radical, I don't think it would get much done, which... No, I mean, that is, that is true, but it uh, wouldn't be able to get much done with his intentions, but it still can create a lot of chaos. And that can, and not, I mean, the government's already slowly getting things done in the first place. Now it's even, nothing's ever going to ever get done. So, I mean, it would really make the system a whole lot worse, I think. Yeah, hey, but this is one of the scary things about right now with Bernie is that you have a lot of other vocal socialist voices in the House of Representatives right now. And if we have a massive rebound effect from Trump, you could, you know, potentially get a lot more of them in there, which yeah. then could support potentially. Well, California <laughs> and New York direction. can send a whole chunk of them. I mean, that's kind of its own problem. Yeah, you want more of a, uh, was the uh, AOC girl over in uh, yeah. New York. Um, you know, people, people like her and, and a couple of other, probably get, probably get somebody like that over here in California as well. Yeah, I'm sure, I, I can, yeah, that, that, that can be pretty uh, disastrous. If only we can maybe get some libertarians elected. Well, I mean, we don't really win a lot of partisan races, but we do have won some a couple of nonpartisan races. Um, recently, uh, Jeff Hewitt won the uh, Riverside uh, County Supervisor seat. What do you guys thought, thoughts on that? Do you think that was uh, is that something that we can reproduce, and, and maybe that's the uh, the key, golden key is follow that same method, or was it pure luck? Well, nothing like that is pure luck. I mean, there's a lot of groundwork that goes into. Some, I was begging the question. <laughs> into, some, into something like that, and, and I think that's really the key: is he shows how important actual groundwork is, to, just mm. to show up and put. If you only even have an hour a month to, to volunteer, you go in and you volunteer that hour a month, and that's what the lesson we need to learn from Jeff Hewitt, because there's different ways to accomplish that goal, but you need the people on the ground, knocking on doors, saying hello, showing up at events. Yeah, it's very rare that, that I actually see uh, libertarians who are running for office who are actually taking it serious. Uh, whenever I, see, I hear somebody announcing they're running for office, I go visit their website and it just says libertarian all over the place. It doesn't even say anything about their that, about what how they're gonna run for office or what they would do in office. It just says, I'm the libertarian. Uh, you know, it, it's really just more of a uh, look at me, look at me type thing. I never see any serious libertarians. And, and Jeff Hewitt, maybe a few other people who ran in the past are, are some of the few people that actually took running for political office as a serious thing. Didn't try running for uh, at the top, you know, worked his way, started off. Um, uh, he was, uh, I know he was formerly the uh, uh, mayor uh, in the city he resides in, but uh, I don't know if he was sort of on the, I think he might have been a city councilman for first. I'm not sure if he Yeah, Cala Mesa, I, city councilman. I, I don't remember. Yeah, it's, yeah it's but a, I mean, he, he he started off in the bottom, didn't go for the top, you know, work, worked his, his name up there, uh, did things, and actually uh, was successful at being in, in office. Uh, that's another thing is you need to have a proven track record, especially if you're running for something where you need about 50,000 votes to win. Which I think when I last checked, I think that was how many he got was roughly around fifty thousand, and that was able to secure a secure victory for him. I think one of the things that probably benefits uh, somebody who who went gradually like him as well is that you're not just jumping in from an ideological platform; you're actually learning how the nuts and bolts of government work one step at a time. So mm -hmm. it, it probably allows him much more understanding of what he can and can't get done versus somebody who just comes in, tries for the home run, and, and misses and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, local politics is different than, um, say, national politics. So you look at AOC. She ran. She was a nobody, a bartender, and then she ran. She cherry picked a district with a with a congress sitting congressman who was asleep, 
mm-hmm. and just ran a campaign, grand, le- grand level campaign underneath him, and her voters showed up and his didn't. And that's how she won. So if you can cherry pick the right district with the right message and mm-hmm. the, the, the right campaign, you can do it. But that's, I mean, you're looking for needles in a haystack. That's a lot of... Do you think someone like, like Jeff Hewitt um, or, or maybe his campaign tactics, do you think it would be enough to win a partisan race? In the right district, yeah. In the right district? Yeah. Okay. okay. You can't go into San Francisco and, and expect to win as a libertarian at the moment. Okay. with. Well, what, what would be an example of the, of the right district? Because, I mean, uh, if you look at most districts, it's either heavily Republican or heavily Democrat. Uh, or if you're lucky, you get a, a, a district that's close to 50-50 in either way. Um, you know, it, it, the libertarians, uh, at most, you know, you'll have 5% or something like that. I think Ella County, which has the second highest number of uh, registered libertarians in, in, as far as counties in, in California, which is my county, um, I, I think we had like 2%, and that was the second highest out of all of California. Uh, Placer County has 2.1% or something like that, which is the highest. That's Sacramento's at 0.97% registered libertarian. See? I mean, we're, we're look, working with small numbers, um, and, and it's always interesting to see how a lot of libertarians, uh, they just want to brag about being a libertarian. When, you're only, when you brag about your party, you're only, you're only appealing to the people who are registered in your party, and, and you got, we have a very small percentage. It's 2%, uh, while maybe most people are not ideologically libertarian, there's a lot of Republicans who are libertarian leaning. There's a lot of libertarian leaning Democrats. There's a lot of uh, um, no party preference people who are libertarian, uh, and a lot of people try to appeal to the no party preference, thinking that that they'll they'll get those votes. But telling them that you're libertarian isn't going to get a no party preference person because if they really believed in the libertarian cause, they would have said they were libertarian way from the get go. I, I think this is the problem that you know we as a libertarian party have, and that's that. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that most people intellectually might be a libertarian, but I think that's more about, you know, the freedom, what they want to do with their own body. But I think the problem is, is that, you know, we set the deck uh, with a public education system over 13 years that essentially mm-hmm. is, is teaching kids that, you know, if, if you uh, need something done, you know, how do we get it done with government? And so it, it's really stacking the deck so that we're, you know, libertarians are essentially saying, you know what? Markets work better than government uh, where markets can exist. And so, you know, wherever we can get a functioning market, let's have the market. And where we can't, okay, maybe we'll, you know, use some government there. But uh, the problem is, is that I think when most, you know, kids who are going through school in our society, they, they really only hear the message of, you know, if, if, if something needs to be done, let's vote on it. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that's, the, that's, a, that's a huge hurdle to overcome, I think, for little Well, I mean, I, and I'll, I'll speak from, from experience. Uh, when I was in high school, both my economics teacher and my government teacher were both libertarians. Hmm. Uh, didn't make the class libertarian though. You know, no. Everyone still either became Republican or Democrat. Uh, me and maybe a few other people eventually became libertarians. Um, and I, I particularly didn't even like my government teacher. I actually hated her, and I, I was actually upset that we agreed politically. Um, <laughs> so, so it, it, it's uh, I, I don't necessarily know if uh, if the school is is really the responsibility, but more or less just just uh, society itself. I think it's a lot more complex. Um, I mean, really, I, th- I think at this point, as far as securing a victory, we're gonna have to you know think outside the box. Now, let me guys ask you guys, what do you guys think of the whole, like, the, um, was it the top two system that we, that we have uh, here in California? When, when you don't really, for the primaries, you just vote, uh, when you vote, it's the top two peop- uh, most votes that end up in the primaries versus the party. Do you think that's a good, good thing or a bad thing? Well, for small candidates, it's terrible. For small, independent candidates, it's terrible because now you're having to compete early, earlier and longer, which costs more money. Mm-hmm. And you don't have it. And not only that, you're, you're, you have a smaller group of volunteers to pull from, and so you're going to stretch them out and burn them out longer. So for, for small candidates, third-party independent candidates, it's terrible. If you're a major party candidate, it's fine. You don't care. You've got all the money and the checks coming in to hire the people you need to hire. Well, them. do you think that maybe uh, it could be swung in our advantage? Um, and here's what the thinking I have is if you have, say, in, your, in a red district or something like that, um, if you have a lot of Republicans that want to run, it dilutes their vote because uh, it's a top two thing. It's not the, uh, it's possible that you can have too many Republicans running and there would be no Republican in the top two. Um, and if you have something like that where you have a bunch of Republicans in, say, a red district and you have one Libertarian or maybe one or two Democrats running and it ends up being a, 
uh, even with libertarians, even if they only got 5% of it, but if, if the, the Republican votes were diluted enough, you could end up having a libertarian be top two with, with a Democrat. Uh, and if that were, were the thing, then you would uh, definitely would secure victory because the Republicans aren't going to vote for a Democrat in a red district. They're definitely going to likely would vote for the Libertarian. Yeah, sure, that's the strategy you want to use if the system's in place. But long term, <laughs> once we are the ones in power, then that it dilutes, then we become benefits of that system and we keep out the very, you know, the small crowd. So we, yeah, sure, you want to use that type of, you want to use that type of cherry picking when you're, as when that system's in place. But what we don't want to do is keep that system in place long term because when it becomes unfairly benefit to us when we're in power. Because we want to, you don't want to set up a system where we become what we hate. Well, come on, we're, we're winning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm in favor of gerrymandering. <laughs> well, let's, let's get a libertarian district that just uh, stretches all throughout the country and just random spots. Well, you could, if, you, if you did the north right, you could probably get there. If you did the northern half of California right, you could probably get a third of Northern California easy. I That's would. the sad thing, I think, is where we do best is if we ever did get a situation where we had a state or a city or a, you know, a separate country potentially, because then people would actually be able to see the comparison. Right now, it's just for, you know, most people who've never heard about it, it's just a bunch of crazy ideas. Well, and, you get, <laughs> and then you get the people as libertarians think of no rules. You know, libertarians, oh, libertarians are, are just a life where no one has no rules. Mm -hmm. No, libertarians like rules. You know, you can watch the convention thing and we yeah, argue over where pragmatic. Commas, we <laughs> argue over commas go. You know, we like rules as much as the next person. It's just the direction of those rules and how deep those rules go into your life is, is where we draw the line. How about like, like, I think uh, like a parliament system or something like that where you just vote for the party and then we can, we can win at 5%. <laughs> it's funny though, when you say uh, libertarians like rules, I think... The, the, the rules that most libertarians are really focused on is the rules of property rights and clear, you know, uh, directed rules of property rights because then that sets the stage for everything else. If, if uh, we say government rules and we're not specific about it, that, that kind of yeah. gets a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it's rules governing, you know, you, don't, you mm -hmm. don't steal somebody else's stuff, you don't mm -hmm. hurt other people, and you don't pollute their, your neighbor's yard. You know, those yeah. kind of basic, mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. a good neighbor rules that we like to live by. Well, I mean, speaking of rules, um, do you think guys think the uh, uh, government controlled uh, controlling me medic Medicare or Medi-Cal and, and you know government uh, you know funded healthcare and stuff? How do you guys think that's going as far as how becoming favorable and and uh, you know making it affordable or not? What, what are some libertarian thoughts on that? I think the biggest issue there is that you know we've got a, a medical system where we have <clears throat> removed. Uh, the price signal. I mean, essentially, the price signal is, for the most part, not completely dead, but highly distorted. Uh, we have a system where almost everybody's gone to third party payer, and most of that has been because the government distorted things during price controls, and I believe it was World War II, I think, you know, where, uh, you know, they, they froze wages, and so then they allowed employers, instead of, uh, you know, bumping the wages, to bump your health care benefits. And so, I mean, these things have essentially distorted throughout history to the point where. You know, we, and, and there's also other issues too, you know, uh, emergency rooms where you say that a person is guaranteed to be covered. Well, these are all things that shift prices. And so eventually the prices get so distorted that, you know, a person doesn't understand that when they go into the hospital for a treatment and they see something, you know, $10,000, $20,000 bill, it's like, where did that happen? Well, it's from this massive distortion of prices that has mm -hmm. occurred gradually over a long period of time. So do you think... Um I mean, the, the government hasn't really been too involved. I mean, they, they're involved in regulating the, uh, uh, the the healthcare market right now. But as far as con controlling it, um, you know, the prices have, got, have gone up. And do you think that the prices of, in, in, in the health industry is up because of regulation purely? Or do you think there's, a, there's other factors in there, such as like subsidization or, or, or something like that? Well, it's actually almost impossible to tell because the market has literally been so manipulated that it's no longer functioning properly. Mm -hmm. um, what you get is you get a discount rate, which is the rate the government pays and the rate that the insurance company pays. And then you get a cash rate, which is if you walk into an emergency room and you pay, and you just want to pay cash, mm -hmm. you get charged a vastly different amount of money than for the exact same service as the insurance rate. Yep. And and I, so, but the insurance company rate is the real cost. Is the real cost plus plus reasonable profit, not the rate that the cash payer gets charged. And so that's the problem. Is we don't have a first thing you need to do is you need to create a you know open and honest system so everybody knows what everybody's paying. You don't get to char charge different people 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, 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 and to speak from more my own personal experience, I'm a diabetic. I, I've been diabetic since I was five years old, uh, and I take uh, uh, insulin, right? And so a lot of diabetics you know there's just there's this uh, a, lot of, a lot of things people are talking about lately with uh, diabetics having to pay thousands of dollars a month, um, and if you don't have insurance, they can't cover all their medical supplies. And what happens is most people go to a doctor and they they pay to pay for a doctor doctor visit. And they get prescribed uh, Humalog, uh, which is a name brand fast acting insulin, right? Um, but what most people don't realize, and what I've discovered, is that one, you don't need a prescription to get insulin. Insulin is an over the counter drug. Um, granted, it's a dangerous drug, so I don't recommend taking it if you're not diabetic, but it is over the counter. Uh, you can buy it, buy it without a prescription, so you don't need to see your doctor. Um, and you don't necessarily have to get Humalog. You can get Humal, uh, Humalin or Nodulin, uh, which, was an, which is an expired patent. So, Humalog. Uh, Humalog costs around three hundred dollars a vial. Um, I buy Novelin R uh, from Walmart for twenty four dollars and eighty eight cents without insurance. Big difference, and, and the only difference between the two drugs is um, Humalog takes about fifteen minutes to kick in and lasts for about four hours. Uh, Humalin or, or Novelin R, which is what I take, uh, kicks in about thirty minutes and lasts about five hours. So minor medical differences, I mean, you might want to consult your doctor before switching the drug, but it, it is pretty sim a similar drug, but it's significantly different price. And that's what happens when you have a competitive market is, is you're able to find one that's a lot cheaper than the other. Well, which also brings up an issue of patents. You know, how long should patents really be, be going? Yes. You know, in, yes. a, in a time when information and stuff traveled slowly, maybe an extended patent period was reasonable. But now that, you know, information and, and all this stuff happens so fast. Mm -hmm. and information and packaging and you know marketing all that happens so fast now that maybe the patents the length of patents should be shortened especially for medical issues yeah well some of this too i mean we we assume also that that patents are necessary in certain pharmaceuticals is probably one of the best cases uh to make for uh, why we might need patents because of those high development costs but one of the things too that you know we should consider a little bit is that we went for thousands of years without intellectual property rights mm -hmm. and the idea that somehow we've we've been convinced that we d that we certainly need them and you know it, it's i think the first thing would be nice is to look for where the distortions are in the system try and get those out and then see if we still need the intellectual property rights <laughs> I mean, uh, it, one of the, uh, well, I'll go on if one of you guys wants to jump in. No, we, were, we, were listening to, we were listening to you. <laughs> yeah, no, no I, and I've, been, I've been, always been kind of a, a critic of, of patents for a, for a long time. Um, I mean, I, I understand like trademarks and things like that, and, and I work for a lot of patents professionally after my, my private career, but you know, that's just the reality of it. Right. That's it for the show, guys. Thank you for watching Libertarian Counterpoint.